an exciting week. Uh, so I am so glad you are here with us today. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Malachi. And so the book of Malachi chapter 2 this morning. And so we're going to be reading verses 1 through 9 in chapter 2 this morning. And so if you have that, go ahead and stand with me. If you do not have a Bible, then you can read along off the screen with us this morning. And uh, we stand here in honor of the Lord of the Word. This is His Word, and we stand in honor of Him. We stand for our national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance in honor of our nation, in honor of our flag. We're going to remember that this next week uh, coming up. And uh, how much more should we stand for the one who gave His life for our eternity? Malachi chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And now, this commandment is for you, O priests, if you do not listen and if you do not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. And indeed, I have cursed them already because you are not taking it to heart. Behold, I'm going to rebuke your offspring, and I will spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your feasts, and you will be taken away with it. Then you will know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my commandment may continue with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with, with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him as an object of reverence. So he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. Unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked, in, he walked with me in peace and uprightness. He turned many back from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge and men should seek instruction from his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But as for you, you turned aside from my way. You have caused many to stumble by the instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So I also have made you despised and abased before all the people, just as you are not keeping my ways but are showing partiality in the instruction. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word does your work by your Holy Spirit in our hearts. And we ask this morning that you would do so. And it is in your name that we ask this. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So, maybe a dangerous question to start off with this morning. What should a pastor do? If you ask 10 questions, what is the major responsibility of a pastor? What precisely is the major responsibilities of a pastor? What is it that if all else fails, this cannot fail from a pastor? If you ask 10 Baptists that, you'd probably get something like 15 to 20 different answers. You probably would. Scary question to ask. But I think we're asking probably the wrong question. I think we should ask... What does Scripture say the major responsibilities of a pastor or a minister should be? What is it that Scripture says, hey, if all else fails, this has to happen properly. This has to take place. What is that? Some people might say, well, that's evangelism. Some might say, well, it's care for church members. Hospital visits, member visitation. I want my pastor in my home. Or guest visitation. You need to go visit those people that were guests. Maybe uh, to lead the church. Maybe it's uh, disciple new believers. Maybe it's I want my pastor to pray for me. All of those are very important things and, and part of the pastoral role. But what is key? What is critical? What is it that makes all those other things uh, not necessarily less important, but what is the most important thing that would then inform and correct and keep on track all of those things? We see in this passage today that the priests had forgotten this major thing. And while Old Testament priests and New Testament pastors are not at all the same thing, I want to make that very, very clear, They play similar roles with God's people. Here is that critical element, and it's what we're going to learn today. 
It's that God holds his pastors accountable for how they follow him and how they teach and, leads God, teach and lead God's people. God holds his pastors accountable for how they personally follow him and then how they lead God's people to follow him. And we're going to flesh that out here today, see exactly what, what does that mean and, and why does that matter to us, pastor, because, you know, you're the pastor, you're kind of like preaching to yourself on this one, which is one of the weird things about the message today, to be honest. There is much that we can learn from this passage much that we can learn from this passage. I want to take a look at the first thing here with me. Number one, we should take worship of God's name seriously because God does. Notice with me, God rebukes his priests in this passage. Now, if you remember from two weeks ago, this started, this is actually part two of that same uh, discussion with God's people. We just started this, calling the series uncomfortable, because what is happening here is God is coming and having some very uncomfortable conversations with his people because, well, they've gotten comfortable and complacent in following. In fact, they weren't really following. They were just fulfilling the ritual. If I could put that in today's terminology, they were coming to church, they were dressing up and looking nice. They were going to Sunday school, they'd sing the songs, they'd endure the sermon, and they would leave completely unchanged, not doing anything. And one of the major problems with this was that they, as a people, had forgotten God's great love for them. This is key that God begins here. When we forget God's amazing great love for us, especially as New Testament believers, expressed in Jesus Christ, that we, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we forget that, that he has come after us to bring us back to him, and in fact has made everything possible for us to come back to him. There is nothing left for us to go do and accomplish for God to be made right with God eternally. Christ has done that for us, and we are clinging to him even when we mess up, even when we sin, even when we make a mistake. Now, we don't get to go sin and mess up purposely. We don't get to go live however we want to do. That's exactly what he's speaking against here. What it does is it takes reality into account. None of us are perfect. And Christ came to redeem those who were not perfect. We need to begin with remembering his love. And then two weeks ago, when we had this, the first part of uh, this passage to the priest, we found out that when they had forgotten God's love for them, their love for God grew cold. It's a normal thing. When we forget God's love for us, our love toward him grows cold. And then... Because personal devotion grows cold, public worship begins to suffer. If there's problem in, in public worship, take a look at per, per personal devotion. Take a look at that in your own heart. Pray for that in the hearts of other people. This is what we have seen here. The problem isn't the performance on the stage. The problem is in our own hearts. Because they had forgotten God's love for them, their love for God grew cold. Public worship became uh, boring, quite honestly. In fact, he says that here. How tiresome it is. Chapter 1, verse 13. The people disdainfully sniff at God's sacrifices. Uh, this is just weary. I don't care. And in chapter 2, he prescribes the remedy. What do we do to fix this problem? What do we do to help heal this? God takes worship of his name seriously. We can see from the people's forgetfulness, their laxity in worship, that they, beyond all question, had taken God's name less than seriously. He pronounces three different warnings, three different things that he promises to bring on them because when there is persistent disobedience, God will bring painful discipline. When there is persistent disobedience in the lives of his people, God will bring painful discipline, not for the purpose of, oh, you're going to treat me like that? Here, I'll 
treats you like this. That's not the point. It is always redemptive in nature to turn his people around. And this is what it takes. Notice the first thing. He promised he would curse their blessings. Told them to take his covenant to heart. And if they would not, verse 2 then I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Now this is a terrible, terrible discipline here because the priests were meant to be people that blessed the congregation of Israel. Their prayers of blessing for Israel, in fact, even their own carrying out of the sacrificial system was meant to be a blessing to the people, leading the people into worship. However, in their not following in their refusal to follow God, in their uh, worshiping God is so boring. The priests, the ones that were supposed to lead the people to know God and follow God in their laxity in this, God said, no, I cannot and I will not bless that. I will refuse to bless that so that every time you pronounce a blessing, it will come back and roll back as a curse upon the people. How horrifying is that? The people that were meant to lead people to know God, to follow God, will in fact be leading people into harsher and harder uh, curse upon, from the Lord, excuse me, curses from the Lord, harsher and harder life. They will suffer as the result. They will be hurt and suffer harm because these people are not leading them to follow God. This is the first step, and that should wake them up. If that doesn't, he pronounces a second thing. He graphically says that he would reject the priests. Notice verse 13. I'm going to, or excuse me, verse verse 3. I'm going to rebuke your offspring, and I will spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your feasts, and you will be taken away with it. Now, this sounds really weird and really awful, and it is. The word that it uses, refuse, there is a picture of part of the sacrificial system. When they sacrificed the animal, the entrails, and well, how do we say this well, all the stuff that's inside the entrails were unacceptable parts of worship. So the guts and all the dung in there, that couldn't be part of the sacrifice. And in fact, what was supposed to happen with that is they were supposed to take that and take it and carry it outside the camp and it was going to be burned on the ash heap outside the camp because it was not, excuse me it was not part of the sacrifice God is telling his priests here, if you do not turn and take to heart my covenant, follow me. So that begins with remembering my love and loving me in return. Then here's what's going to happen. You are going to be just like that dung. I'm going to take this and I'm going to smear that all over you and just like it, you, with it, will be taken outside the camp. You will be sacrificially unacceptable to me. Your priesthood will be taken away. And then thirdly, he says to the priests, and this one, jump down a few verses into verse 8, that they would be despised by all the people. The people would recognize they're not following God. They're not doing what God had called them to do. In fact, the people would recognize in verse 9 that they are showing partiality. But as for you, verse 8, you have turned aside from my way. You have caused many to stumble. By the instruction, you have corrupted the covenant of Levi said the Lord of hosts. So I have also made you despised and abased before all the people. So what God does is strips out all of the, the, the foundation for those people. He's going to take away their priesthood. He's going to take away the people's approval for them. And he's going to give them no ability to do what God had called them to do. And that's to bless the people, to lead the people to know God, the very thing they were created to do, the very thing they were trained to do, the very thing they were set apart by God's word to do. This is a very stern warning, by the way, against pastors. That we don't get to get up here and just preach what we want and do what we want. But in fact, we are called to preach and lead God's people to know God through his word. Why would God turn, or excuse me, why would God 
pronounce such a horrifying curse upon people like this? Why would he send such discipline? And verse 8 tells us very, very plainly why he would do this. They had turned from him. And in turning from him, these people that were meant to lead people to know God were actually leading people astray from God. The people set apart to lead people more and more and more into God's presence, more and more and more into alignment with God's will, more and more and more to know God, love God, follow God, were actually turning people away from God. The very people that were meant to be a safeguard for God's people were not safeguarding God's people. In fact, were wearied by this, bored with it, had forgotten God, did not love God, and consequently, the people were suffering for it. The direction of this is actually the same as what we've already heard. Because they had forgotten God's love. We would say it today from a New Testament side. Because these pastors had forgotten the gospel. Their love for God and their response to God had grown cold. And consequently, public worship, the leadership of God's people, had become off target. This is a great danger in our society today. The gospel is not something that was, oh yeah, I've done that. I did that way back then. No, the gospel is central. Our relationship with God through Jesus Christ That is still, if you are a believer, whether you came to know Christ this past week at Vacation Bible School or you came to know Christ 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, the reason you can carry on a relationship with God still is because Christ has purchased this for you and you stand rightly related before God, not because of you and how well you followed, but because of Christ and his blood shed for you on the cross. And this should constantly lead us into awe and wonder, as it says later in this passage. Constantly lead us back to our knees. Constantly lead us to love and worship the Lord personally. When that grows cold, when we forget the gospel, when we forget this is what God has done for me, everything else begins to fall like dominoes. That first domino begins to fall and the rest begin to fall after it. The gospel is absolutely critical to our church. Because here's the problem. In this sense, even though this is two pastors or priests in this passage, which we're relating to pastors here today, this is also every bit as true for you. When you forget, I am right with God because of Christ, not because of me. And I am called now to follow him because of his love for me, out of a love for him, not to try and earn my way, not because I'm paying him back, but because he loves me, I want to know and follow him as Lord. Because he purchased purchased me, paid for my sin on the cross, I want to follow him. When we forget the gospel, when we forget that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we forget that God so loved the world, even though the world was against him and didn't care for him and hated him, he still came for the world that had rejected, hated, and sinned against him. And this is who we were And this is what he has done for us. He has rescued us from our sin, from our rebellion. He has paid for our sin before the Lord so that our guilt is taken away. We are forgiven before the Lord for all of our sin, past and present and future, so that we can walk forward with him now more and more and more and more and more and more, growing in him, knowing him. This is why he came, that we may know him. John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life, 
not praying a prayer, not showing up to church and going to Sunday school and tithing. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now let me tell you why this is important for us as Bethel. Because just as the worship of the priests became unacceptable before the Lord so that God had to send heavy, heavy curses upon him, great discipline upon them to turn them. Remember, all of this is redemptive, to turn them back to him. We also have to be careful because we can greatly offend God when we come here and worship forgetting the gospel, forgetting him, not making him as the focus. God has always been concerned about the worship of his name. From Genesis 4, we have Cain and Abel. Abel's sacrifice accepted before the Lord. Cain's not. We read in Hebrews that it was by faith Abel offered a better sacrifice. He offered in faith a sacrifice of the lamb. And so uh, pointing again to Christ, Cain didn't. And in fact, we remember he killed his brother because of that. Even from the very beginning, God said, there is an acceptable way to worship me, and there is an unacceptable way to worship me. And it begins with remembering me. You go on to Exodus 32. We read that God was ready to destroy his people when they made the golden calf. Probably one of the craziest stories ever. God had led them out of Egypt, had shown his amazing power led them down to Sinai. We're talking, this is probably weeks, maybe at the most a few months after watching all of these things. Moses goes up onto the mountain, is up on the mountain for several days, and they say, well, we don't know what happened to him. Aaron, make us this uh, God so we can serve him. And here's what's interesting. When we tell this story, we often forget this part. Aaron said, okay, give me your gold. I'm going to make this this animal. And then when he had made this golden calf, he said, okay, set yourselves apart because tomorrow we are going to have a feast to Yahweh, the Lord. This is the Lord, is the picture. And what we begin to see is people taking upon themselves, well, we can worship God as we kind of see fit. We'll worship God as we like. We wanted to see a picture of the God. Okay, here he is, even though that went clearly against the commands that God had given them just 12 chapters earlier, probably just days, if not weeks, I mean, weeks, if not days earlier. Then Aaron gives the lamest excuse in the world when Moses comes down. I don't know what happened. The people told me to make this calf, and so uh, I, I, I threw all this into the fire, and poof, out came this calf. My kids can come up with a better excuse than that. i got to be honest. That's horrible. We always try and cover for our lack of worship. We always try and cover for our lack of worship. Leviticus 10, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, offer unauthorized fire incense before the Lord. This seems so minor. I mean, God said offer this stuff. They offered something else. You know, I I kind of think of it this way. God said offer juicy fruit. They offered spearmint. What's the big deal? The big deal is that God is holy and has prescribed how his people should worship him. God did not leave worship up to our opinions and what we could come up with. God wants us to know him and worship him properly. And because of that, Nadab and Abihu were consumed by fire that came out from God's presence. Even in the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, God has always prescribed for his people how they should worship. It always begins with remembering him. And it always leads God's people to focus on what God has said in his word. When Jesus said, well, they shall worship God in spirit and in truth, This means by the Spirit of God in us from who we are on the inside. We would worship in spirit, yes and amen, but also in truth, the way God has revealed himself to be. In Romans 12, we're reminded that worship is not about what we do here when we come and sing. I mean, that's part of worship, 
but it's a small part of worship. That's what we usually think. That's, that's worship. Our worship leader gets up and leads singing. That's what a worship leader does. And worship, according to Romans 12, is about all of our life as a living sacrifice before the Lord. That means all of our life living in line with who God has said he is. So another pastor explained it this way. And I've used this analogy before, so if, you, if you've heard, remember this one, forgive me, but it still works well. Many of you know my wife, and so she usually sits down here in the second service. Many of you have seen her. I happen to think she's gorgeous and the most beautiful person on the face of the earth. And so uh, I know you may not think that that's totally fine. You're wrong because she is. And so, so, um, so let's just say I am caught up in love for my wife just today. And just, you know, I'm up here preaching and God just overwhelms with, with a, a passion and a desire and love just for my wife. Uh, not just for, you know, physical beauty, although she definitely has that, uh, but, but just for her as a person. So we go home after, uh, uh, after the service today and we have lunch and uh, kind of send the kids outside and I set her down on the couch. I sit next to her. I take her hands in mine. I look at her in the eye and say, honey, I just want you to know how much I love you, and I love everything about you. I love who you are and your character. I mean, I love your, I love your fire red hair and brown eyes and olive colored skin. Now, those of you who know my wife would know, okay, something just went wrong right there. Because my wife does not have fire red hair. She has dark brown hair. She doesn't have brown eyes. She has blue eyes. She doesn't have olive-colored skin. She has very fair-colored skin. Nothing wrong with any of those other things. I'm just saying who I just described wasn't my wife. Now, at first, my wife might think, oh, this is so nice. This is so sweet. And then that description comes out, and immediately her hands are going to be withdrawn, and that face is going to sit there in horror going, I don't know who you're talking about and who you're loving, but it ain't me. And yet so often there are times we come into worship saying, God, you're this way. God, you're that, and I love that. And God said, that's not who I've said I am. That's not who I've told you I am. And so our worship, our worship, it is critical for us to recognize. Our worship must be centered on God's word, who he has revealed himself to be focused on him, not on us. And that's difficult in our society when the question that is most often asked about worship is, how do you worship best? I think this leads us into idolatry most often. Personal preferences do not drive worship. The Spirit of God drives worship. He is the focus of worship. He is why we come here. His great love for us. I want you to notice the second thing with me. Pastors should model God's, excuse me, pastors should model for God's people a life devoted to God. This is what God's priests should have been in the Old Testament. Verses four down through verse seven. What he does in this passage is give them a picture. Here's who your ancestors were, or at least some of them. Some of them didn't follow God. Some of them did. And God gave them a picture, here's what you should be doing, here's the way you should be going. There are three major things that we see from this that are named again and again in this passage. The first one is a reverence for God. If you'll notice verse 4, then you will know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant may continue with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him and was one of life and peace. And I gave them to him, gave this covenant to him as an object of reverence. So he revered me and stood in awe of my name. The first thing that a pastor must be. The first thing that a pastor must do is he must be somebody, man with a reverence toward God who personally worships the Lord who knows Christ because of what Christ has done for us, knows the gospel, not just knows about it, but because of what Christ has done for him, knows Christ. 
Charles Spurgeon said this is actually the most important category for a pastor. Are you a believer? Because nobody ever got saved by being a preacher. Nobody ever got saved by being a preacher. The one who knows the stars knows my name. That should lead us, lead me into awe. The one who knows the stars knows your name. That should lead you into a sense of awe that he wants us to know him. He came here for us. These priests remembered that God was God. One pastor said it this way, one commentator said it this way, Malachi knew in his own experience the awesome awareness of God's blessing that expresses itself in deep reverence for God. This reaction of awe at God's name was far removed from the insolence of those who offered that which cost them nothing, were bored with worship, and yet had the utmost confidence in themselves. The second thing that we see from this passage is that these priests taught God's word. Verse five, my cup, excuse me, my, verse six, true instruction was in his mouth, and then if you jump down to verse seven, the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. This is one of the critical aspects of a pastor. A pastor is not one who can just create neat things in his mind, and then just keep everybody captivated. Or as one pastor said, man, you ought to preach. You can keep everybody awake for 30 minutes. Wow, okay, yeah. No, no, no. The preacher is God's messenger. What's God's message? His word, the gospel, that Christ came to redeem us from our sins so that we can know and follow God. And what should God's man give himself to? He should give himself to the proclamation of God's word to God's people so that we will know here's who God has said he is, here's how we relate to him, here's how we follow him. James Montgomery Boyce, a pastor from Philadelphia, once said this, to speak the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth is a large assignment were it not for the written word of God, which is the preacher's duty to proclaim. Left to ourselves, we could speak little but error, or at best, truth mixed with error. But when we proclaim God's word, we proclaim what is eternally truthful, not only for a particular moment in history or a particular person, but true for all time and for all people, to proclaim that word is a great responsibility. One of the neat things about this is as he proclaimed God's word, or these priests proclaimed God's word, notice the end of verse six. He turned many back from iniquity by sharing God's word with people we reveal to people, this way is the way God wants us to go. That way is the way God doesn't want us to go. And it leads people to turn away from sin, away from iniquity, away from ways that God is going to judge and bring discipline on them and leads them more and more toward Christ, more and more into the way of God's blessing. This is critical for us to teach and proclaim God's word. For while, yes, absolutely indeed, the gospel makes us completely right before God, and it's Christ and Christ alone. In Christ, those of us who are believers, there are still ways he has proclaimed for us. Walk in this way, not in that way. In this way is blessing. In this way is discipline. And even though as believers we will never ever lose our relationship with God, this does not mean the way we live is now unimportant. In fact, the way we live is very important because just like the priests, the way you live also teaches people about Christ, whether you want it to or not. The third thing that's absolutely necessary from these priests and absolutely necessary, necessary for pastors is godliness. 
that they would walk with God knowing him and this would come out in their lives in terms of obedience to his word. James Montgomery Boyce, I quoted him just a minute ago, he said this. He said, it really, I, I don't care if people pray that I become a good preacher. I really don't care about that. I don't care if people ask that I become successful in their prayers for me, uh, in, in the, the way the world counts success. Here's what I want for them to pray for me that I will be faithful to obey the word of God. Because that's what God blesses. That I personally would be faithful to carry out the word of God, faithful to obey by the power of Christ, God's word, more and more and more and more. Reverence toward God, teaching God's word, godliness. Or if we could translate these concepts to know God personally, to obey God by obeying his word and to share his word. These are the three concepts that were necessary, that were missing from these priests. And these are the three concepts that you need to require from me, that you need to require from Mark. You need to require from Kyle, the pastors that God has called here. These are things that are absolutely necessary. Absolutely critical to the word heading forth from here. And I want to encourage you to pray for us in that respect. Because your prayers do have an effect. That we would be people who would know God more and more personally. And who would obey God more and more. And who would proclaim God's word rightly. And here's why. Because pastors, according to the New Testament, 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't look anybody, let anybody look down on your youth. But in all of these things, be an example to the flock. Pastors are the model that people of God are to follow. Pastors were never meant to be the subcontractors. I'm not any good at the Jesus stuff, the following God stuff. I'm going to lay all of that on the pastors. I'm not any good at raising my kid, my, my student, my youth. I'm going to put all of that on Kyle, make him do all that stuff. I'm not any good at sharing Christ, so what I'll do is if somebody needs to know Christ, I'll call the pastor and make him come do that. No, no, no. We are to be an example for you in all those things. We want to help. We want to be there with you. We always want to share Christ, but we want to equip you to do that. And in all of these things, we are an example. So when you are praying for us, you are benefiting yourself, you are benefiting our church, and you are benefiting the corporate witness of our church in this community. Because we are not simply meant to be people that do ministry for you, we are meant to be people that are models of a life devoted to Christ. This is critical for us to grasp, that we have been called into a relationship with Christ, and that we are to follow his word. And we are to follow those who are following God's word. So as Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. As we don't follow Christ, don't follow us. In fact, come to us and say, this isn't what God's word says. You're not leading us to follow God's word. I want to encourage you to follow us as we follow Christ. Because he has come here for us. He has died for our sin. Perhaps you're here today and you've never considered the claims of Christ. That God came here to redeem sinful people who had sinned against him. And that includes you. Because he loves you. And he died for you. So that you may be fully made right with God. That you may know him and walk with him more and more and more and more and more throughout this life. He has created you for himself. And he offers you this gift of life in Christ. Who took your sin to the cross. Paid for it fully. So that you may be completely forgiven and righteous before him. That you may know him and walk with him. Will you embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior today?
He has called you to him for this reason, that you may know him and walk with him. Will you embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior today? We're coming to our time of response, our time set apart for responding to him. And for some of you, that's the response you need to give today is turning and trusting Christ, turning from your sin to embrace Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus Christ himself said, whoever comes to me, I won't cast him out. So if you come today recognizing that you're a sinner, that you don't want your sin anymore, you want to follow the Lord, this is the picture of repentance. I, I don't want that. I struggle against that. But I want you, Jesus, to be my Lord and my Savior. That's a picture of repentance, coming back to following him and trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior, a turning and clinging to Christ. Christ alone saves. Will you trust him as your Lord and your Savior? However, for others of you, maybe you have come here and you recognize, man, there are some things in my own heart where I have created an idolatry in worship, where I come seeking what is best for me in worship instead of seeking the Lord in worship. I want to encourage you to repent and turn, trusting in Jesus Christ today to cleanse you of that sin. For others of you, Maybe you have not followed the example in Scripture, the example of pastors that you have known of a life devoted to Christ. God calls his people to take to heart because the priests were the example to the people. The people were to follow them, calls God's priests and the people as a whole to take to heart his covenant with him. Don't just, oh yeah, I did that and then we leave. Follow him. Cling to him. Know him. Remember his love for you expressed in the gospel. Seek him. Know him. Follow him. Personal Bible study. Prayer. Time with the Lord. Corporate worship then will be expanded. And the corporate worship, excuse me, the corporate mission of our church testimony of our church will expand as we put him first and remember him first. Let's pray and respond. Jesus, thank you so much for today. Thank you.